In today's show, it's another ADP battle. I'm going to be joined by Alex Raclean of RotoWire, and of course, I am joined by Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore B-Ball and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Bet BetOnline has you covered this season with more props, odds and lines than ever before. Bet Online is where the game starts. Thank you for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms and I am here On this platform, whatever platform it is you're choosing to listen to, to do another ADP battle. This man's done this with me for, I don't know, three, however long I've been doing it, I think. He's been on every year that we've done ADP battles. And that is, of course, from RotoWire, the professor of fantasy sports. You actually teach a course in fantasy sports. It is Alex Raclean. Alex, welcome back. Uh, Welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, if I recall, I was actually the first of these because you and I disagreed a ton back in... 2019 or whatever year it was and so you had me on to debate them and you're like yeah i should keep doing this yeah we have, we've done this for <laughs> for quite a while and there is quite a bit for us to talk about again with um with adps but um how's how, just, how, how are you going heading into fantasy basketball season nba season you're you're feeling good about stuff i am i'm excited i'm glad to have a sort of normal season where we're not yeah. worrying about vaccination status and where we'll have normal rest between games. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Um, and I feel like the first sort of four or five rounds are deeper than usual. So I'm having a little bit more fun in drafts than I, than, than usual. I feel like it's the fun part of the drafts is lasting a little longer than it, you typically expect. Oh, that's interesting. I think a lot of people are having maybe just different, different thoughts. I'll, I'll tell you what, I hate round two, but I love round three, four and five. I think there's a bunch of guys there, but trying to yeah, that's why auction drafts have that increased value as well because you can just sort of get mm-hmm. get the guys you want but a bunch of round two guys are pretty weird but no, you're right there are some guys who do slide down quite a bit into the 80s and 90s but we're going to talk about at the top of the draft to start things off we're going to talk about pick number 10 and i'm going to be honest there's not a huge difference between these two guys but i wanted to discuss them um here well maybe there's a huge difference to you in this one um Alex, uh, at pick number 10, LaMelo Ball is available there in a lot of spots. Carl Anthony Towns is available there in a lot of spots. I am down on Towns this season. I'm just a little bit worried. Not only I was worried before the health stuff and all these you know, platelet injections that he's apparently had, but I was worried about him losing usage to Edwards and then rebounds, blocks, and um, paint touches to Gobert. Um, so I'm a little bit down on him, and, and I would take Ball here, but you don't seem to be as worried about Towns. I'm not as worried about Towns, and I am a little worried about Ball. Um, I The jump from, you know, top 20, 25 to top 10 is one of the hardest to make, both in the real world and in fantasy. And um, I feel like Ball hasn't made that leap, and, and Towns has been there for a while. So, yeah, there's, you know, Edwards' continued development and the addition of Gobert, um, knock cat out of the top five for me but i know that cat can do it and and i sort of have some faith maybe wrongly placed but some faith that uh the timberwolves are going to figure out how to um use all their stars in a way that all of them are able to get productivity um and the other element with with ball that i don't love is he's maybe got the worst field goal percentage of anyone going in the first round. Um, and I like to maintain that flexibility. Um, I usually end up with a build that is strong in field goal percentage. And I'd prefer not start with that drain um, that goes against sort of something that I try to build strength in later. 
interesting to see. I, I have no problem with having poor field goal percentage. And I would say that he's probably on par with like a Damian Lillard or a James Harden for first round field goal percentage guys. But you're right. There's a lot of other guys who have much higher field goal percentage in that first round. But there are a couple of other guys who are on the lower scale of things. Um, I, I agree with you that Ball hasn't done it to the level that Towns has done it in the past. At some point, they are going to cross each other, and I think it is this season. Yeah. And one of the main reasons I look at that is that the ball played 32 minutes a night last season. Like He's easily got scope to play 35, but even if he plays 34, like just extra two minutes onto that, even if there's no actual improvement in per minute rates or anything like that, like those extra two minutes, I think, make a big difference. Now, maybe that's offset by Steve Clifford slowing down the pace, but there is also a little bit more usage available with their second usage player, Miles Bridges, not there. So Lamelo maybe can tick up 1% or 2% in usage as well. So I just think that that, with the increased minutes, with the third year um, additional knowledge that gets gained with so many of these players heading into year three, and then I have my concerns on Towns. I don't have them far apart. Like I would take Lamelo at 11 and probably Towns at 13 or whatever there. But generally, if they're on the board together, I will go ball every time over Towns. Um, and you would obviously just go Towns over ball. But I'd imagine you don't have a big, big difference between them. The gap is somewhat meaningful. I have, I have, um, I have sort of a, I in my head, it's there are sort of fourteen people who are like Agreed. borderline round one topic, Agreed. and I, and I don't have Lamelo in that fourteen. Um, I have ah. him, I have him as my fifteenth, but I see him, I see a drop off between him, Paul George and him, um, and, um, and I'd rather Paul George. I, I are you concerned at all about? what we've seen over the last uh, three days with um, Wembenyama and the Hornets might be a bad team. Um, you know, especially if things start off sort of, if, if they don't get off to a fast start, are they going to be keeping LaMelo's minutes at 32 and maybe pushing that down to 30 and trying to lose some games? Do you have any fear of that? I just spoke with that with Zach just before we came on. We talked about our fear of tanking guys and I'm, I'm not really factoring that in too much. Also, their owner's a notorious psychopath who probably <laughs> d- doesn't want to go that way. Their coach is also maybe a little bit psychopathic as well with that sort of stuff. So I'm not really sure Steve Clifford, he's not to the same degree as Michael Jordan is, but I'm not sure they're going to be saying, let's just play Lamelo 30 minutes a night to try and lose more games. I think Michael Jordan would get out on the court himself and and start trying to throw it down on people if that was the case. I just think that, that assumes Michael Jordan is following what's happening in the day-to-day life of the Hornets. I imagine all... Maybe. <laughs> maybe he's not, but I imagine all it would be, all it would take was someone saying, hey, Mike, did, have you seen the Hornets? It's like they're trying to, trying to lose on purpose. And he'd be like, hang on a second. And you go down there and you stand on the base side and you just stare at everybody and you just be like, what are you, what are you guys doing? And they, they're the team that constantly is like, let's get to the seventh seed. Let's get to the... Like, they refused yeah. to trade Kemba Walker even though it was obvious he wasn't going to be around. Like they trade to... Ca- they refused to cash in. because like, Let's get to the play in. Let's the play in now. Let's get to the eight seed. Let's get to the seventh seed. Like they value that over so many other things. And maybe they're just actually terrible and they don't... Um, they're not even in that mix, but then they'll just be terrible and they don't necessarily have to change anything to get to be that bad. But it is something that I know a lot of people are going to be asking the question. I'm not factoring it into my analysis a huge amount this season, um, but yeah, that could change. I'm not for LaMelo. I am for two people, for someone we're going to talk about in a couple minutes, but I'm not. For LaMelo, that's not, um, like, that's not the driver of me having him at 15 instead of in the top 12. Spicy. We'll get to that in a second. But before we do that, I'm going to tell you that Bet Online is your number one source for football betting info this season. You can find all the latest player developments, team matchups, news, podcasts, and in-depth articles and analysis on every game you can find. Alex, do you have an NFL team that you support? The Patriots. Oh, that's an L for you. Not, not, our, be- not our best season. They are three-point underdogs to the Cleveland Browns. That's how you know. Well, that's next week, actually. Next week's odds are already up at Bet Online. What are their odds this week? Who do you play this week? I'm trying to find it on this odds uh, list. Oh, you play I'm the Lions. Sure. Three-point favorites against oh, the, right. the number one offense in the NFL. So let's see how that goes down for the Patriots. But whatever game you want to find, week five is up there. Week six is up there, apparently, as well, as I just looked at. You can find it all at Bet Online, including live betting and up-to-the-minute scores. It's also the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your favorite games and events, including Major League Baseball with the playoffs starting. MMA, boxing, and golf. So head to BetOnline.net or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet Online is where the game starts. All right, pick 30. Two teammates. They're on the board at this spot. It's Pascal Siakam. It's Scotty Barnes. What are you doing? I, I like Scotty Barnes here. I am 
really excited about this crop of second year players. Um, I, someone pointed out to me uh, <laughs> earlier today that I've got some jumps for kind of all of them for Cade, for Franz, um, for Scotty Barnes. I'm factoring in a bigger than usual jump. Usually I'm a little hesitant with the second year guys um, and other people jump them, bump them up higher than I do. But um, I'm really optimistic. I think that they recognize that his develop, they, the Raptors recognize that his development is sort of core to their long-term ceiling. And so I think that, that, you know, that usage is going to continue to go up. Uh, I think that we've seen a lot in terms of his confidence and I like the way that he is able to contribute basically everywhere. He doesn't really, he's a little bit of a drain in um, threes and free throws, but not a terrible drain in either. Um, and I, I, I like that. Uh, I, I just, it's a lot of just sort of faith that he's improving and that Siakam might be on, on the down slope. Um, you know, he's an old 28 and a half. Um, and he, you know he has done it, but I'm I'm a little worried that he'll maintain, and I'm worried that he'll yield usage to Barnes. Interesting. Now you are you're you're not willing to give Lamelo Ball that ascension or that you know he hasn't done it before, but I think he will. But you, you are giving it towards Barnes, so that, I find that interesting. Now, obviously, everyone knows that I hate Scotty Barnes, and I think he should be a G League player, and maybe he should actually play in the NBL. <laughs> like that's how bad I think he is. Um, but obviously, I have I have Barnes improving pretty significantly from last season as well. And I've got him maybe like early 40s, maybe late 30s around that area. But I also have Siakam much earlier than that. I, he was like almost, I think, top 20 in the second half of last season after he came back from that shoulder. He played a staggering amount of minutes. And I think Barnes will play a similar amount too. I just think that we might be one year away from Barnes maybe overtaking because Barnes hasn't got to that All-NBA level yet. Pascal has. Yeah, and he did, it, he did it literally four months ago. Like Siakam was playing at that All-NBA level four months ago. It's not like it's in the distant past. Uh, I would take Siakam every day over Barnes, and that is not to rule out that Barnes could finish ahead of him this season, because that's always possible. It's more I look at it and go, all right, if every, if I simulated this season 20 times or 100 times or 10,000 times, I think the vast majority of my, I see Siakam going uh, or finishing ahead of Barnes, and I'd need a, quite a few different things to happen, which might have smaller percentage chances occurring for Barnes to get there. So I just wouldn't take that risk in this situation. Like, again, maybe I'm being hypocritical because I do take a bit risk expecting Lamelo to step up. And I do expect Barnes to step up, but I also don't expect Siakam to drop back off. I wonder, I'm sort of processing out loud. I wonder if part of it is just, Siakam is in a area of the draft where there are a couple of bigs who I just want more than him. And I wonder if I'm almost knocking him down a little extra because I'd rather... DeMontas, I'm rather Gobert. I'd rather, um, I'd kind of rather Jared Allen, although that one's a little closer. Um, you know, Porzingis, I'm at, at, at this point in the draft, I might consider the upside of Porzingis, even though there's obviously the health issues. Um, so I wonder if it's just, if that's part of it, is it just if I'm going big, there are other players I like more at that spot. Yeah, that, and that's fair enough. We talk about, I've talked a lot about you know, positional scarcity and statistical scarcity and getting the right guys in the right spot, even if their ranking doesn't align with where you're taking them. And sometimes that's that can be a part of it, is looking, hey, I need to get a big man. I need to get blocks. I need to go earlier on Gobert or Turner or um, um, Jared Allen, as you said, because holy, look, where am I getting these guys later on with Rob Williams and Jaron Jackson out? Like, they just don't exist. So I, I do get that. Um, I still would take Siakam over Barnes, but... I do get where you're coming from. Now, this next one, I'm not sure that I get where you're coming from, but let's do it. It's at pick 80, but I'll, I'll listen to what you have to say and then we'll go from there. Pick 80, Josh Giddy is somehow still on the board. Andrew Wiggins is on the board. You're taking Andrew Wiggins. Are you okay? <laughs> yeah. All right. So two, two points here. First of all, I, the 70 to 100, like I, I was tweeting about this the other day. If there is no one you could pick at 70 that I would think, great value and there is almost no one you could pick at 100 who in that sort of 30 person tier where I'd, like everyone at 100 i'm like yeah that that's a pretty good spot for them yep. i kind of want all of that group to be at 100 but some of them have to fill up in earlier um with giddy i am avoiding the thunder ferocious like as much as i can uh they have shown an uh, aggressiveness to tanking that 
we honestly haven't seen outside of Philadelphia ever. The way that they are willing to shut down multiple players. And Giddy, I think, is their second best player. Um, and I think they think that he's their second best player. And so I would be absolutely shocked if he plays 50 games. And 50? so as wow, I would be shocked if he plays 50 games. Um, I'll be shocked if he doesn't. Uh, I would be shocked if Shy plays 50, if, Sh- if Sh- Sh- Shay plays 50 games. And I would be shocked if Giddy plays 50 games. They are going to, the stakes are higher than ever. It's the Thunder's last year of the tank. Um, they are going to find ways to sit these guys. And that knocks both Giddy and SGA way down in my ranks. As for Wiggins, he, the odds of him producing top 80 value aren't great but I kind of like him as a floor play and I'm very intrigued by what happened in the playoffs last year that was interesting. and the possibility that that sticks. If Andrew Wiggins can continue as instead of a four rebound get per game guy, a seven or seven and a half or even eight rebound per game guy, which he was not just in the Celtics series, but in the couple series before that, I think the, I, th- I was looking at it the other day. I think it was 8.5 over the last three series or something. Yeah. The numbers were huge. Um, it, multiple yeah. double digit rebound games. Yeah. Um, if he can make that a steady part of his game, that really boosts him in an area of the draft where I don't like very many people and, you know, getting 17 points and five rebounds and some contribution in almost every category in a part of the draft I don't love, like, especially if I reached for Zion or Chris Stops or uh, some of these sort of riskier picks earlier, I really like Wiggins as mm. a solid floor play who has the upside of what if he continues the playoff role that he had. Let's, I do have his rebounds bumping up this season, not to eight, I, but I do have it. I think eight, eight's unlikely. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's it's one of those guys that like the, I don't know what the right word is, but the fact that like after the finals, man, like all it took was for me to give effort and then I can get rebounds. Who knew? I don't see that. <laughs> I don't see that attitude sustaining for six months. I can see it for 16 <laughs> games or 20 games in the playoffs. I can't see him having that. If rebound, if rebound to him is like, man, if only I tried... Um, like I don't, I don't see him doing that for six months. So, and the fact that he's so bad at free throws, he's not particularly efficient from the field. He's not a big. I don't know. He's just bleh to me. Like to me, I, I put him way down. Like Giddy's, there is some risk of the Thunder. I'm not as. I don't think it'll be as aggressive as people think it'll be. I just, it wasn't as aggressive as as. Look, there was Giddy did get hurt and missed time after the All Star break, but the other guys all played through to about March 24th or 25th or something like that. So I'm not as worried um, about that as others. And we just had a discussion about that. But yeah, I think 50, 50 games is crazy low. It's so low. And I, I, so I tweeted this out the other day, Alex. Tell me what you think of it. Of it. But with as soon as that Wembenyama scoot game happened the other day, every, every second person tweeting about it, it was like, man, I can't believe how good victory is. Man, scoot's amazing. It was like, oh, if, and then the other person would be, the tanking is going to be outrageous. Everyone's going to be shut down at Christmas. That it, 50% of tweets were saying how bad every team is going to try and tank. Now, I think Adam Silver hates that. And I think he's going to be getting in there and giving the little notes to you guys like, you you need to stop doing this shit or else you are going to get fined a lot of money. And I, I think that they're going to be extra vigilant on it. Um, and they've, they've shown something in the past with, with doing that. But I think with so much, they hate that negative publicity where you think well half the teams aren't going to be trying and i think it's going to be even more pronounced that idea out there that they're going to be really really focusing in on trying to make sure not that they can 100 percent all prove all this stuff but trying to make sure the teams aren't doing that to to the degree that maybe the general public thinks because perception's part of it as well like if people think what's the point of watching the nba when half the teams aren't trying i think silver's going to be uh knocking on some doors so I, I just I wonder how much control he's really going to be able to exert. The stakes are higher this year than they are in in they are. some previous years, um, and sure maybe they'll be able to exert some pressure on the Pistons, but I just don't see the Thunder really responding. You know, Silver can send them all the letters that they want, but the Thunder has a great medical team who has earned the trust. And if the Thunder medical team says we want 
SGA to miss more games, they've got the credibility to sort of pretend, even if it, even if they're kind of pretending. I, I just, I don't know how viable that pushback is. And with the play-in, it's not going to be half of teams. It's it's going to be five teams. It's m- m- maybe six. Um, it's going to be bad from those five or six. But I, and, and I don't think Silver has much control over that. Um, but I do think it'll only be five or six teams um, that are really in this sort of horribly aggressive tank job. Um, but I mean, SGA is less than 90 games or no, 90 games over two seasons. Um, Giddy played 54 last year that maybe they get 50, but I don't think they get much over that. And that I, that's a lot of missed I'm games. It's going to be really interesting to see what happens with, with all of this stuff going yeah. on. It's going to be very intriguing. And this is also intriguing. Now, Alex, you are known often in the fantasy industry. Maybe people who listen to this podcast are someone who's like, rookies, I never heard of them. I don't know them. I don't care to know them. Um, let let them do whatever they do and I'll ignore them. And then you, but you always say, I have to pick 100. I have to pick 100, mm-hmm. then I'll take a fly. So then you sent me your ranks and you had Mark Williams. Mark Williams yep. sitting right at 101. Oh, so, hi, Mark. Oh, so you were sitting there waiting. You were just like, man, wait till he gets 100. Then I'm putting Mark Williams. He's right there at 101. Now, I think it's pretty bold to have, <laughs> have the Hornets third string center priced ahead of Devin Vassell. Admittedly, you only have them a couple of spots ahead, but he's literally their third string center at the moment, Mark Williams. And I don't think he's really ready for NBA action. I get there is some blocks upside there, but to me, that's round 11 in a 12 team. No, it's not. It's round nine in a 12 team. So that is actually like you're drafting as a starter and you're taking a third string center. Explain yourself, sir. Third? Plumley and who? Nick Richards is their backup at the moment. You think Nick... I, have you have you I, met I mean, Steve Clifford? I know you probably haven't met him, but this bloke hates rookies <laughs> as much as he hates um, playing at a fast pace or, or, or hates you know, offense. Like, he hates rookies. He hates them. He just won't play them. I just... I just don't trust coach speak when, you know, the coaches are hyping up Mason Plumley in the preseason. Uh, if, you it was, know, if it was a normal <laughs> coach, I'd, I'd, be, I'd agree with you. I just like, I, there's a limit to how much I'm willing to buy in on that. When I think that I think Mark Williams, I really like him as a prospect. Um, I was very ex- like, I was, ex- I'm, I routinely say part of the reason I don't draft rookies early is because I'm not a scout and I don't even think scouts are that good at their job and I would be worse at their job than they are. Um, but from what I saw, I thought Mark Williams looked like a really great prospect and particularly a great fantasy prospect because of that sort of length, that ability to get blocks and rebounds. Um, and it's the part of the draft where I'm willing to take flyers. Um, you know, centers are a position of scarcity. Blocks are a, a category of scarcity and I, you know, him and uh, Jalen Duran are, are, I'm targeting both of them a lot at this range to get that upside of, you know, worst case I drop them, but if, if something happens quickly, um, I, I've got them to start with. And I, Jalen Duran, I think he's even, he's, he might actually be a third string or fourth string. He really? might actually. No, no, no. Play. What I understand is he's going to be playing um, backup center because Noel's hurt. Um, I, yeah. you know, I think they're almost going to be exclusively doing Isaiah Stewart at the four. It will not exclusively, I would love that. but I think they might be. But the problem is he'll be as a four on the bench unit. So I, I think Duran is going to, is a little bit ahead of where I thought he'd be. But he's another coach that hates rookies is Dwayne Casey. So yeah, yeah my faith in those guys. There. I think more to the point, like you're right. Like you can take a flyer at pick 100, 110, 120, and you drop him. Who cares? Um, it might work out. It might not. But I think more that I want to do this is the fact that you know, he only had him three or four spots apart. But like, why are you not believing in Vassell? I just, I'm. I'm not nothing about Vassell and people have gotten excited about him. And I've just, I haven't seen it. I am not excited about him as a prospect. I'm not really particularly excited about his fantasy game. And, you know, I think I look at this roster and I think, all right, who's going to sort of who who's going, cause you know, this is probably going to be a relatively bad tanking team. Mm-hmm. Who do I think will be getting stats and I like Keldon a bit more. I like uh, Jakob Portal a bit more. I like Trey Jones a bit more. Um, and if I'm sort of willing to consider all of those guys relatively high and even reach for them, then, you know, maybe that says something about um, Vassal. And I just, you know, even his per 36 numbers, they're just not that exciting. Eh. 
I don't know. It's another one where the low field goal percentage throws me off. I tend to, once you get below 43, that kind of throws me. I just, he, he's never been someone I've been willing to buy in on. I think this targets back to what you said about Mark Williams. Like I really liked Vassell as a prospect. I liked what he did second half of last season. He was top 100 after they traded Derek White. Um, he gets steals. I think, you yeah, you talk about who's going to take shots. Like it's him and Calden. Like is how many shots yeah. is Pirtle getting? Like is Jeremy Sohan going to start? Is Kader Bates Diop going to take shots? Is Trey Jones going to take shots? Like almost definitely not. I'm hopeful for Sohan in a deep in a deep league. I'm taking him the Sp- uh, in the late round. The, the Spurs don't play rookies. Like I, they're starting. I know. They're, they've got Bates Diop there. They've got McDermott. They can play and not necessarily big minutes. They've also got Isaiah Roby, right. who they're playing almost exclusively as a four as well. So I do like Sohan as well. But Sohan might average six points in twenty minutes. Like that that is also a possibility. Whereas Vassell's gonna play thirty. Oh yeah. He's gonna play thirty plus yeah. and he's not gonna to fall to most spots is in most drafts. In some he does. He's not gonna fall, but I just wanted to just talk about how you are down on him. And this next one is a really interesting one. It's our last one we're gonna do. Um it's pick number ninety. Isaiah Jackson or Tyler Hero. Now, Isaiah Jackson, we I love the value of him, right? I think he's gonna be a, a top forty player at some point. We have to wait really for that to evolve until Miles Turner is traded, and I think he, I think he's probably a guy that I look at a little bit later on. But he he's, he will be sniffing the top one hundred even in a reserve role. I feel um, that's mm-hmm. how good he can be. But yeah, if you can get him at one hundred and ten, it's really it's great value. I would, I guess, team build is dependent here because we talked already about the the lack of blocks and big men. But I would still prioritize getting Tyler Hero, who I think is going to start this season. Not that that changes huge amounts for him. Maybe actually drops his usage. But you've got Hero down pretty low, like outside the top 100. And I'm not the biggest Hero guy, but I think surety of role and production maintained through the season, where Jackson, even if he starts, maybe he only plays 25 minutes because he he had had six fouls in like 15 minutes yesterday or something, or four fouls in 15 minutes yesterday. Like fouls might actually stop him achieving that full ceiling, at least in this season. Yeah. Um, so I think we're, we're kind of agreed that what's interesting about this is more how low I am on here on hero yeah, yeah. where I am on, I, on Jackson is pretty normal. I might even be lower than some experts on Jackson. I love his game. I've got yeah. him in a dynasty league and I'm thrilled about him. I was taking but him at like I, 80 before they said, yeah. Hey, no, we're keeping miles turn. I went, oh, are you though? Yeah. And then I dropped him down a bit, but yeah, like he, he could easily smash through that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so where I'm low is, is on hero. That's what sort of different yeah. here. And I, you know, I've written about this in the past and maybe I'm falling victim to a mistake. I've told people to avoid about over indexing on the playoffs. Fantasy is a regular season game and the regular season and playoffs are different. Um, and I've now talked about playoffs a few times this year or in this pod, which just hearing the number of times I've said playoffs makes me worry. Um, but Hero's production and Hero's role during the playoffs kind of um, make me a little worried. You know, even excluding that last game where he only played seven minutes, uh, through the rest of the playoffs, he 20, 26 minutes down from 33, um, 13 points uh, down from 20, four rebounds down from five, three round rebound, three assists down from four, and they were giving Max Struess a lot of a lot of love. Um, and Victor Oladipo showed some ability to exist. And, and I'm a little worried that what's going to happen this year, um, if Kyle Lowry is there and present and in shape after he got scolded publicly, uh, at the end of the, (laughs) at the end of the playoffs, when they got eliminated, uh, what if Victor Oladipo's role increases? What if Struess's role increases, um, is Duncan Robinson really dead? Like he was so <laughs> he was he was a legitimately like useful player for a while. What happened to him? Yep. Um, and so I just I'm I'm worried that we could be in for a big step back on Hero, um, and I I'm sort of hands off on him. I. I can see, I can see this, right? I, I agree. There is a lot of weird guards there, but they also just paid him 
too much money, in my opinion, to you know, for them to say, go back to a 25-minute-a-night role here, Tyler, and we give Max Struess and mm. yeah, the broken-ass Victor Oladipo some more of those minutes. I, I, I get the concern with it, and I think at times those guys are better players than him. But I'm just not sure that that's going to come to fruition in the regular season. But I am, like, I'm moving Isaiah Jackson up every day because can we just keep hearing more about Miles Turner? And if you are playing in a head-to-head league, you want to have the higher value guys towards the end of the season. And I think it's almost inevitable that Jackson's going to be one of those guys. Now, I'd caution about going yeah. too early, but... Yeah, I, I don't mind it. So I'm not that far off. And again, it's just an idea for us to talk about how, why you're that lower on Hero. Because I can... Yeah. Yeah, I've picked Isaiah Jackson at 80 before in, in mock drafts. Just to... Yeah, hey, let's get yeah, him here. I've, I've been him in here. them and annoyed because I was going to take him yeah. a couple picks later. Let's sit him here <laughs> and let's see what happens because yeah, yeah. it might be bad for a month or so, but he, he can still... He, it's not like he's going to be... And I talked with Zach earlier today, which was yesterday when the podcast was released, about like yeah, sitting on a Benedict Matherin who might be the 250th best player for four months until something right. clicks and something opens up with Buddy here, like that might happen. Like Isaiah Jackson might be 120th and then 30th in your fantasy playoffs. Like that's that's distinctly possible yeah. as well. So there is more value there because he's got a floor of being useful and then a ceiling of being unbelievable. And yeah, may, maybe you're convincing me that I would take Isaiah Jackson. But it's, a lot of this is also like, what do I need on my team? Of course, because they're very yeah. different players. Alex, I'm going to get you out of here on that. Tell people what you're doing. At the moment, people can find you obviously at your fantastically short Twitter handle and tell people what you've got coming out in these uh, week and a half before the NBA season starts. Oh, I have no idea what I'm doing <laughs> these days. I'm so tired. Um, <laughs> I have a newborn. I'm tired. Um, check me out. Follow me on Twitter. I tweet whatever articles I write uh, over there. Um, everything I write's over at Rotowire. Uh, give me a follow and thanks for having me on the pod. No worries, mate. Um, I think you, uh, I think you're back on when we're doing the fantasy basketball telethon sort of thing next week. So you were back on yep. for some questions on that. Go follow Alex. Go check out his work. Thank you again for coming on. It was a blast. Thanks as always. And that will do it for me today. Don't forget to follow this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and on the Odyssey app. If you're on YouTube, you thumb it up. You leave your comments down below, guys. We are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.